குட் ஈவினிங் ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் ஐ வெல்கம் யூ ஆல் டு த ஹிந்து நியூஸ் பேப்பர் அனாலிசிஸ் பிராட் யூ பை த சங்கர் ஐஏஎஸ் அகாடமி டுடேஸ் டேட் இஸ் நைன்டீன்த் டிசம்பர் டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி த்ரீ பிஃபோர் என்ட்ரிங் ஆர் டிஸ்கஷன் ஐ ஹவ் அன் இம்பார்ட்டன் அனௌன்ஸ்மெண்ட் ஃபார் யூ சி கைஸ் மார்க்ஸ் யூர் கேலண்டர் ஃபார் அன் அன்மிஸ்ஸபிள் ஆப்பர்ச்சுனிட்டி ஆர் யூ கேரிங் அப் ஃபார் த யூபிஎஸ்சி பிரிலிமினரி டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி ஃபோர் வெல் வி ஹவ் காட் த ஒர்க் ஷாப் ஜஸ்ட் ஒன்லி ஃபார் யூ ஜாயின் அஸ் ஃப்ரம் டிசம்பர் டுவெண்ட்டி த்ரீ டு டிசம்பர் தேர்ட்டி ஃபார் அன் எக்ஸ்க்ளூசிவ் அண்ட் ஃப்ரீ யூபிஎஸ்சி பிரிலிமினரி ஒர்க் ஷாப் வெதர் யூ ஆர் இன் அண்ணா நகர் ஆர் கனெக்டட் விர்ச்சுவலி ஃப்ரம் எனி பிரான்சஸ் திஸ் ஒர்க் ஷாப் இஸ் டெய்லர் மேட் டு ப்ரொப்பர் யூர் ப்ரிப்பரேஷன் டு த நெக்ஸ்ட் லெவல் ஆர் அஜெண்டா இட்ஸ் பேக்ட் வித் இன்சைட்ஸ் அண்ட் ஸ்ட்ராட்டஜிஸ் தட் யூ நீட் டு கிராக் த பிரிலிமினரி எக்ஸாமினேஷன் ஃப்ரம் சப்ஜெக்ட் ஸ்பெசிஃபிக் டிப்ஸ் அண்ட் ட்ரிக்ஸ் to dissecting the previous circulation papers and analyzing the trends this workshop has it all if you are worrying about handling unknown areas fear not we have got you covered learn effective strategies to tackle those unfamiliar terrains with confidence see is he such stressing you out not anymore our experts will guide you through proven strategies to ace this session plus get ready for the personalized study plan designed to optimize your learning curve and understand the paramount importance of test series through brief storming and prefit Secure your spot for this intensive 7-day workshop. Limited offline seats available at Annanagar. So hurry up, register now and gear up to conquer UPSC Preliminary 2024. I have attached the registration link in the description box. Don't miss this golden opportunity to set yourself on the path to success. Join us for the UPSC Preliminary 2024 workshop and let us crack it together. See you there. So here are the list of news articles which we are going to discuss today. So without wasting time, let us get into discussion. Look at this news article. This article is taken from the science page of the Hindu newspaper. See, this article is about the mRNA or messenger RNA. It explains how mRNA works in our body. This article also talks about the applications of mRNA. See, this is the crux of the article. In our discussion, we will understand all these points in a detailed manner. Let us start with the mRNA or messenger RNA. To have a better understanding about this mRNA, we have to first understand about the functioning of our cell. See, as we all know, our human body is made up of trillions of cells which carries out various specialized functions. One of the main functions of this cell is protein synthesis. Our cells produce more than 1 lakh different proteins that are essential for the normal functioning of our body. The proteins produced in our cells helps in the breaking down of nutrients, It also helps in carrying other important chemical reactions of our body. Now let us see how do the cells produce protein. See, the cells in our body do not produce protein on their own. The instructions and the process for making this protein would have to come from DNA. See, DNA is present inside the nucleus of our cells. The DNA contains a set of instructions to make protein. DNA is acting like a set of cookbook that contains different recipe to make proteins. here note that the cell does not read the instructions directly from the dna molecule instead the cell makes a copy of instructions from dna with the help of a similar molecule called mrna or messenger rna see it is termed as messenger rna because the mrna contains the message or recipe from the dna to produce a desired protein in our cell okay to put it simply The messenger RNA is a molecule in a cell that carries message from DNA to produce protein in the cell. Here note that once the cells recognize the instructions from mRNA, the cells makes the use of instructions and finally it destroys the messenger or it destroys the messenger RNA. See this is all about the basics and working of mRNA. Now let us see the applications of this messenger RNA. As I said earlier, the proteins made in the cell are essential for our body to function. See If the cells makes wrong protein we can get diseases so by decoding the mrna scientists can easily create instructions for making correct protein in our body these instruction can also be edited to meet the specific needs of the patient see as i said earlier the cells used to destroy the mrnas when they are not needed so because of this fact the doses of mrna can be easily changed to meet the changing requirement of the patients these factors of mrna helps in addressing the disease that are caused by improper or wrong protein synthesis see this is the first important application of mrna technology secondly the mrnas are used in the production of vaccines see we can synthesis mrna from the harmful disease causing viruses after the synthesis we can make vaccines that contain mrna of the harmful viruses see when these vaccines are injected in our body the mrnas are absorbed into some of our cells after that the cell read the mrna recipe of the virus 
and it makes the spike protein that the virus used to invade in our cells see as we all know the covid also uses the spike protein to inject into our cell so as a result our immune system recognizes the spike protein as a foreign material and it will produce antibodies to that pathogen literally the mrna vaccines prepare our body to attack the virus if we encountered it later and this is like the mock drill in the army see as the cell used to destroy the mrna after the use the mrna of the virus does not cause any harm in our body see this is the advantages of mrna vaccines the covid-19 vaccines from moderna and pfizer biontech are some of the examples of mrna based vaccines see this is all about the news discussion in this news discussion we saw about the basics of mrna and in second part we saw the applications of this technology so with this learned points let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis look at this news article as you all know 78 opposition members of parliament were suspended from the ongoing session the editorial here is written in this context only the article highlights the decline of the deliberative discussions in our parliament and thereby a slow decline of our democracy see this is all about the crux of the article in this context let us try and answer a main question on the role of the parliament look at the question discuss the factors contributing to the decline of parliamentary authority in modern democracies suggest measures that can be taken to strengthen the role of parliament in ensuring a effective governance and accountability see this question can be asked in gs paper 2 under the subtopic of parliament and state legislature structure functioning conduct of business powers and privileges and issues see this is all about the syllabus now come to question see this question has two parts first we have to write about the factors that have resulted in the decline of parliamentary authority in the second part we have to write about the measures that can be taken to address this decline okay this is the schema of how we are going to approach this question okay now let us approach this question let us start with the introduction as this question is talking about the accountability and the decline of accountability we can write a short description about accountability in our introduction first of all in general accountability refers to the obligation of institutions individual or organization to take responsibility for their actions or decisions it involves being answerable for the consequences of these actions particularly to those whom got affected by the actions see this is the basic definition of accountability to translate this into a governance here accountability in governance refers to the responsibility and answerability of the government officials institutions organizations to the general public accountability ensures that government officials act in the public interest and they are being responsible for their actions decisions and the use of resources see in indian context accountability manifests in various forms through the election process the elected representative are being held accountable by the electorate citizens exercise their rights to hold the politicians accountable through periodic elections then there is a parliamentary oversight of accountability here parliament holds the government accountable through debates discussions question sessions and the functioning of parliamentary committees here also we have article 75 which clearly states that council of ministers or executive are collectively responsible to the legislature or lok sabha article 75 also contains the principles of individual responsibility also so then to ensure financial accountability we have comptroller and auditor general of india under article 148 this cag audits the government expenditure and financial transactions to ensure financial transparency and accountability in the public spending see also we have judiciary which plays a key role in upholding the accountability here it does this by ensuring the adherence of rule of law interpreting the laws fairly and providing checks on the power of executives the judiciary also hold the government accountable through article 13 32 and the and the basic structure doctrine see these are all some of the provisions in the indian context to ensure the accountability of government guys i have given a very elaborate introduction you can pick two to three points from all we have discussed now in your introduction part of the answer i can say that specifically you can use accountability points which are related to legislatures and uh, cag in your intro somewhat very relevant with respect to this question okay now having completed the introduction now come to the body part of the answer here in the first part we have to highlight the factors that have led to the loss of parliamentary authority firstly 
the integrity of the MPs who should ensure parliamentary authority is being questionable. This is because many MPs in India have criminal histories. See the data, around 43% of the Lok Sabha 2019 members facing various criminal charges, thus it affecting the credibility of the parliament. Secondly, the parliamentary sessions in India are not held in a most efficient manner. On one hand, the opposition party members are not following the parliamentary decorum. On the other hand, the ruling party is suspending the opposition members left and right for raising question about the functioning of government. This has reduced the protective deliberate culture of the parliament. And above all, there has been a steady decline in the number of parliamentary sittings. See, the sittings of parliament are declining over the years from 100 to 150 sittings in 1950s to 60 to 70 sittings as of now. See the third point. In many cases, the government has used the ordinance route to circumvent the parliamentary discussions. According to the data published by PRS, the present government in India since its time in office from May 2014 has passed 76 bills through ordinance route. It includes some of the notable legislations like Controversial Citizenship Amendment Act, Specified Banknotes Cessation of Liabilities Ordinance 2016 and GST Compensation to States Amendment Ordinance 2017. See, then there is a declining role of parliamentary committees. The percentage of bills which are being referred to the PSC has witnessed a decline from 71% in the 15th Lok Sabha to 27% in the 16th Lok Sabha and this has further fallen to around 13% since 2019. In addition to this, lack of expert decision in the parliamentary standing committees and the politicization of discussions has also reduced their effectiveness. Then the CAG, the country's premier watchdog for fostering the financial accountability and compliances has been less effective in its functioning in the past couple of years. The CAG reports related to union ministries and departments came down from 55 in 2015 to mere 14 in 2020. This fall is of nearly 75 percentage. Due to this, the parliament is not able to ensure financial accountability of the government. See, finally, strict party disciplines also curtails the MP's ability to exercise the independent judgment and scrutinize the executives. In India, the anti-defection law has been criticized for undermining the individual independence of the MPs by compelling them to vote along the party lines. See, these are some of the factors that have led to the decline of the parliamentary authorities. See, all these points addresses the first part of your answer. In the second part, we have to write about the measures that can be taken to strengthen the parliament. Firstly, steps can be taken to empower the committee system. The scope and independence of the PSC or Parliamentary Standing Committee can be expanded by providing more resources, time and expertise to the parliamentary committees, a more thorough and impartial evaluation of the governmental policies can be achieved. Secondly, transparency measures are critical. So, you can make that making parliamentary proceedings, decisions and votings easily available to public is a vital step. Utilizing the technology to broadcast the live session allows the citizens to directly access the debates and decision-making processes. Know that this will foster greater transparency in the process. Then, steps must be also taken to encourage constructive debate within the parliament. See, creating an environment that values substantive discussions while discouraging the confrontation is very important to ensure parliamentary accountability. We can establish the guidelines for a respectful discourse and inclusivity which will allow a diverse opinion and collaborative problem solving to our democracy. See, then steps must be taken to increase the role of opposition in the decision making. Allowing the opposition a meaningful role in the decision making process and the key parliamentary committee will ensure a balanced scrutiny and oversight in the process. Recognizing their viewpoint in policy formulation and facilitating the active participation is critical for the robust parliamentary democracy. Also, steps must be taken to provide training for the MPs in the process. See, capacity building and training for MPs will enhance their understanding of the legislative process and the modern day governance. See, this will ensure strong ethical standards and a code of conduct within the legislatures. These are some of the steps that can be taken which will help fortify the parliamentary role in ensuring accountability, transparency and effective governance. See, all these points will address the second part of your answer. Now, let us go to the conclusion part. In the conclusion part, you can mention 
how deliberative discussions and parliamentary authority will help india in both short and long term you can also mention that deliberative discussions and parliamentary authority will help in making an informed decision and thus it will ensure effective in governance moreover it will enhance the accountability it will ensure representation of diverse views and ensure legislative effectiveness all these steps will increase the public trust in the government this will help the largest democracy in both short term and long term see this can be your moral conclusion if you have better way of uh, concluding or better way of uh, presenting the main body of the answer you can feel free to write and post it in the comment section see this is all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the decline of parliamentary authority and the various reasons for it and the second part we saw how various steps can be taken to improve the parliamentary authority in the modern democracy so this this learned points let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis look at this news article yesterday india launched its first winter expedition to the arctic region this expedition is being led by national center for polar and ocean research ncpor which is located in goa this expedition has two objectives firstly it aims to evaluate the sustainability of the arctic region for carrying out the precision astronomical measurements apart from this it also aims to explore the possibility of deploying the home built saras telescope see this is the crux of the article in this discussion let us see some points about india's arctic policy and saras telescope see before entering our discussion let us see a few points about india's research center in the arctic region see India has a significant stake in the Arctic region. In 2008, India established its research station called Himadri. It is located in the International Arctic Research Base at Svalbard, Norway. See, the Himadri research station was launched as a part of India's Arctic program. It involves in studying the climate change and the impacts. See, this is all about the basic. Let us get into discussion of seeing the India's Arctic policy. See, India's Arctic policy was released in March 2022. This policy is titled India and the Arctic Building a Partnership for Sustainable Development. Here note that multiple stakeholders are involved in the implementation of this policy. They are academia, research community, business and industry. Note that NCPOR or National Center for Polar and Ocean Research NCPOR is the nodal institution for monitoring the implementation of this policy. See it is an autonomous institution functioning under Ministry of Earth Sciences okay now this arctic policy has six pillars which i have displayed here have a look at it see through this six pillars india's arctic policy aims to achieve the following objectives like it aims to strengthen the national capabilities in the field of science and exploration secondly the objective is to enhance the understanding of how the climate change and its impact in the arctic region can affect our or india's climate economic and energy security thirdly the policy aims to contribute to the better analysis prediction and coordinated policy making on implications of the ice melting at the arctic region fourthly it aims to study the important topic of linkages between polar region and the himalayas of india and finally it aims to deepen the cooperation between india and the countries of the arctic region see this is all about the india's arctic policy now let us see the another important topic which is related to prelims called saras telescope see the saras telescope is the short form of shaped antenna measurement of the background radio spectrum 3 see it is indigenously designed and built at raman research center bangalore see it is basically a radio telescope here note that radio telescope is an instrument that receives radio waves from the space through this radio waves the telescope finds the position of stars and other objects in the space moreover the saras telescope is designed to detect the incredibly faint radio wave signals from the cosmic dawn phenomenon see cosmic dawn is a period when the first stars black holes and galaxies in the universe are being formed so through this telescope we may be able to find the fine truth behind the formation of our universe stars etc see india is planning to install this telescope in the arctic region this is because of the clear sky in the arctic region which will facilitate the clear and uninterrupted radio signal receiving see this is all about the news discussion in this discussion we saw two important portions for our preliminary examination 
In the first part, we saw about India's Arctic policy. In the second part, we saw about the SARS telescope. So, with these learned points, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis. Look at this data point article. It analyzes about the trend of the CAG reports which are being submitted to the parliament over the past years. We know that the CAG, Comptroller and Auditor General, is a constitutional authority of India. See, CAG is responsible for auditing and assessing the government's financial accounts at various levels. According to Article 151 of the Constitution, CAG submits the annual audit reports to the President and the President in turn will submit this report before the Parliament. On doing all this, the CAG ensures the principles of transparency and accountability in the government. See, the article given here is talking about the declining trend of the audit reports being laid before the Parliament. See, this is the crux of the article. In this discussion, we shall understand some important points about the Comptroller and Auditor General of India, CAG, from the preliminary perspective. First of all, know that Article 148 of the Indian Constitution provides for the office of CAG. See, CAG is a person who heads the Audit and Account Department of India. Moreover, CAG is an independent institution. Here, I use the term independent because CAG is not affiliated to any central government ministry. Note that numerous accounts and audit officers are assisting the Comptroller and Audit General in doing his functions. So, together they are all being referred as the CAG. See, now coming to appointment and tenure. See, the CAG is appointed by the President of India. He or she must take oath before entering the office. And this oath is being administered by the President of India. The CAG holds office for a period of 6 years or up to age of 65 years, whichever is earlier. See, the CAG is provided with the security of tenure. This means he or she can be removed by the president based on the procedures which is being mentioned in the constitution. So, despite the CAG is appointed by the president, he or she does not hold office under the pleasure of president. Note that CAG is not eligible for further appointments under the central or state government after cease to hold office. Now, let us move on to the removal process of the CAG. Generally, CAG can resign at any time from his office by addressing the resignation letter to the president. This is called voluntary resignation. Now coming to the removal procedure. See, the CAC can be removed by the president based on the same ground and the same manner of removal of Supreme Court judge. The ground for removal is proved misbehavior or incapacity. See, the removal resolution must be initiated in any house of the parliament based on the set grounds. And if both the houses of parliament passes such resolution with a special majority, then CAC can be removed by the president. This means CAC cannot be directly removed by the president. This is all about the structure part of this institution. Now, finally, let us see the functional aspects of these institutions. Firstly, the CAG audits all the accounts that are related to the expenditure from Consolidated Fund of India, Consolidated Fund of each state, Consolidated Fund of each union territory that are having the assembly. He also audits the all the expenditure from the Contingency Fund of India and of each states and the Public Account of India and of each states. Secondly, CAG audits the receipts and expenditure of all bodies and authorities which are being substantially financed by the central government or state government. Moreover, he also audits the receipts and expenditure of government companies, corporations or bodies. Thirdly, the CAG audits the accounts of any other authority when the CAG is requested by the president or by the governor. Fourthly, the CAG submits this audit report of central government to the president. As we all know, the president in turn places such reports before the houses of parliament. Similarly, for the, with respect to states, CAG submits the audit report to the governor. The governor in turn places such reports before the assembly. Moreover, finally, the CAG advises the president in matters regarding the accounts of center and states. See, these are all some of the important functions performed by CAG or CAG. That's all about this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the important trends of declining the auditing of CAG. In our analysis part, we saw about the CAG, its structure and functions from the prince perspective. See, with this learned points, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis. Look at this news article. This news article reports that India's net direct tax collections had grown significantly. See, as of December 17, 2023, the net direct tax collections for the current fiscal year stood at approximately 13.70 lakh crores. See, by highlighting this data, the finance ministry said that 75% of direct tax target for the current fiscal year has been met. 
among the debt tax collection the corporate tax has the highest weightage with approximately 695000 crores then next it's being followed by personal income tax with approximately 673000 crores see this is the crux of the news article given here in our discussion let us understand some points about direct taxes before that let us learn some basic terminologies about tax section see in taxation you have to know about the two basic terms like tax impact and tax incidence here the term tax impact refers to the first resting point of a tax and the term tax incidence refers to the final resting point of the tax now i will explain you with an example for example let us say a company named x is making biscuits upon making biscuits company x pays tax to the government for its product this is what termed as tax impact this means the tax impact is initially borne by the manufacturer but when the biscuit reaches the customer the tax burden is shifted to the customer so when we buy biscuits we pay the money not only for the biscuits but also as a tax so ultimately the tax burden is shifted on to the customers this is called tax incidence this means the one who is bears the burden of the tax in a eventual manner okay to sum it up initially the impact of tax is borne by the manufacturer but the manufacturer gets back his tax money when a customer buys his product so at last the incidence of tax is on the customer see the example which we saw is for the indirect taxes but note that for direct taxes both the tax impact and the incidence is on the same person for example when we pay income tax the impact is borne by us and we know that incidence also fall on us okay this is all about tax impact and tax incidence now finally let us see some point about direct taxes see the direct tax refers to the tax that is being directly paid by an individual or an organization to the government here note that the direct taxes cannot be transferred to others in india dt accounts for 50 percentage of the governmental revenue the major direct tax includes income tax wealth tax security transaction tax capital gains tax and corporate income tax see now let us see some data about the direct tax collection for the previous fiscal that is fiscal of 2022-23 see in this year the net direct tax collection had stood at to be 16.61 lakh crores among the collections the corporate tax served as the largest tax source with approximately 10 lakh crores it's being followed by personal income tax with approximately 9 lakh 60 thousand crores here note that out of 9 lakh 60 thousand crores about 3 lakh crores have been issued as refund back to the taxpayers see this is all about the discussion in this discussion we saw about the two important terminologies of taxation that is incidence and impact of taxation and in the later part we saw about the data regarding the direct tax collection with this learned point let us uh, conclude this discussion and take up the next news article for our analysis look at this news article gyanwar bi masjid is located near the iconic kashi vishwanath temple in uttar pradesh varanasi the name of the mosque is said to have derived from the adjoining well the gyanwapi or the well of knowledge recently the supreme court allowed the archaeological survey of india or asi to conduct a scientific survey of the premises know that the aim of the survey was to determine if the mosque had been constructed over the pre existing structure of hindu temple the asi completed the survey and submitted the report to the varanasi district court see this is the crux of the news article in this context let us revise about the important organization called archaeological survey of india or asi see the archaeological survey of india is an attached agency of the ministry of culture government of india it engages in archaeological research and conservation and it also engaged in protection and preservation of ancient monuments or archaeological sites in the country remember asi regulates all the archaeological activities which are conducted throughout our country it does this function under the provisions of Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act or AMASR Act 1958 know that ASI also regulates the Antiquities and Art Treasure Act 1972 see this is about the basics of ASI let us see what is the origin of ASI or how did it come into existence see it all started with sir william jones and his founding of asiatic society on 15th january 1784 in calcutta later in the year 1871 the archaeological survey of india was created as a separate government department know that sir alexander cunningham was elected as the first director general of asi alexander cunningham is also known as the father of indian archaeology 
See, till 1904, there was no legislation to protect the important monuments of the country. During the time of Lord Curzon, this situation has changed with the passing of Ancient Monuments Preservation Act of 1904. See, this law gave ASI a firm footing. Since then, ASI has been successfully conducting excavation, rediscovering the past, and safeguarding the important heritage structure of the country. See, after independence, ASI became a statutory body under AMASR Act 1958. See, ASI is headed by a Director General, and it is headquartered in New Delhi. See, this Director General is assisted by Assistant Director General, two Joint Directors, and 17 Directors in carrying out all the functions of ASI. Also note that ASI governs all the archaeological activities under the AMASR Act and Antiquities and Art Treasures Act 1972. See, this is how ASI came into existence. See, with this basics about ASI, let us move forward and let us see the functions of ASI. First important function is protection. See, ASI safeguards ancient monuments and archaeological sites in nationwide. It also aims to prevent illegal trafficking of art antiquities or treasures. The second important function is maintenance. ASI is responsible for the conservation and preservation of significant monuments and archaeological sites across India. This involves ongoing efforts to ensure that these culturally important sites remain intact for our future generation. The third function it involved in exploration and excavation activities. See, ASI conducts archaeological explorations and excavations to unearth and study historical artifacts, structures, and remnants. These efforts contribute to a deeper understanding of our country's history and civilization. In addition to excavation, the ASI also takes up architectural survey. See, this function involves conducting the survey of various monuments, studying the inscriptions, which is called epigraphy, and studying the coins, which is called numismatics. All these studies aid in comprehending the architectural styles, historical significance, and cultural context of these sites. Fifthly, it provides training in the field of archaeology. Through this, it fosters a new generation of professionals who are equipped with the necessary skills. The sixth function, it conducts international expeditions. ASI engages in archaeological expeditions beyond Indian border. It also participates in collaborative projects and thus contributes to the global archaeological knowledge and cultural exchanges. The seventh function, it establishes and reorganizes museums at archaeological sites, thereby creating a spaces to exhibit and preserve the various artifacts which are discovered during the excavations. Finally, it is involved in horticultural operations as well. See, ASI undertakes horticultural activities around the ancient monuments and sites. Thereby, ASI ensures the preservation of surrounding environment, enhancing the aesthetic appeal and overall preservation of this culturally significant sites. See, these are all the important functions of ASI. So, in our discussion, we saw about the structural part of ASI and how did it come into existence. And in the second part, we saw about the various functions of ASI. This is all regarding the discussion. Now, let us move on to the next part of our video, that is to discuss the preliminary practice questions. Now, today I am having three questions. Let us solve them one by one. Consider the following: treating cancer patients, production of vaccine, gene editing. See, the applications of mRNA can be used in which of the following fields? See. For this kind of application based questions, we need to have a solid evidence to refute that this cannot be used as an application. So, here you see all these are related to somewhat medical field and we cannot refute that this messenger RNA cannot be used. So, all these three statements will be correct and the correct option is option C. See the second question. In the financial year 2020 to 23, which one of the following tax accounted for the second largest source of the net direct tax income? After corporate tax, see in the financial year 2020 to 23, the net direct tax collection stood at 16 lakh crores. Out of this, corporate income tax stood at 10 lakh crores, and it is being followed by the personal income tax with approximately 9 lakh crores. So the correct option here is personal income tax. So the correct option is option C. See the third question of the day. It is a previous question. The term indoor, sometimes seen in the news, is in the name of what? Out of the four. See, Indark is India's first underwater observatory located halfway between Norway and North Pole in the Arctic zone. The observatory is anchored at the depth of 192 meter 
and it has the array of various sensors. The aim of the observatory is to study the Arctic climate and its influence on the Indian monsoon. So, out of the four options, the correct option is option D, India's underwater observatory to scientifically study the Arctic region. So, the correct option is option D. See, the uh, main question based on today's discussion is being displayed here. Interested aspirants can write and post it in the comment section. If you like today's video, like, comment and share it with your friends. For more updates regarding the UPC preparation, subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy. Thank you.